Hey guys, this is Kaijin Hunter. Like I do every year, I want to do a look back into what I played in 2018 and share my thoughts about what I enjoyed. Now, this is just a podcast-like video. There's really nothing but a still image of the game that I'm talking about at the time, so you can just put this on in the background, and if you're interested, just sit back and listen, and we'll go over what I played this year. Now, unlike uh, last year or the one before, I'm not going to call this my top 5 or whatever like that, because I honestly didn't get to play a lot of games. Monster Hunter took up a great majority of this year, and I recognize that there are a ton of awesome games that I have not yet tried. So to say my top games is kind of dumb because I really don't have a very good sample pool of other games to compare them to. So straight out of the gate, obviously from January was Monster Hunter World. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a review copy, so I was playing it a little bit earlier than the rest of you guys. So this really took up a lot of my time in January. And in my review, I called it the best Monster Hunter game ever made. And indeed, I do think that it lays the foundation to be the best generation of Monster Hunter. But if we're going to be honest and look at the total package, it's still halfway through the generation. So how much Iceborne can fix on the things that need to be fixed and expand on the things that they did right will really make or break this as the greatest game ever made. But it certainly is the best selling, the best looking, and it is the most rich, I think, uh, execution of the original concept. Uh, I won't go too much onto the game because we've been talking about it all year, but basically this game took up, oh gosh, I'd say a good three, four months of my life. Um, that's all I was playing for the beginning of this year, so I missed out on a lot of other good games because I was so into this. I ended up buying an Xbox One X because of this game because I was so obsessed in getting the best sort of rich experience that I could, even though I had the PlayStation 4 Pro. I got the Xbox One X and I'm very happy I did. That became my new save, so I can thank this game for actually introducing me to another awesome game system. So, very happy that Monster Hunter World has done so well around the world, and next year with uh, Iceborne is going to be fantastic. Now, as for my wish list, I'm not going to say I want more monsters or locales because, come on, if they're making an expansion, we know they're going to have those. The main things that I really want to see, and I don't think they're going to do the first one, which is changing the idea of how weapons look. Um, I really like in the classic series that uh, weapons are made out of all the materials that you get from the monsters. and They have very, very unique designs. I don't care if it takes us out of the more realistic nature of the graphic, uh, I don't know what you would call it, it's not really realistic, but you know what I mean, um, and go back into a little bit more fantasy-wise. I don't mind if that means that we can get some unique weapons. I also want to see a better endgame. I'm not a fan of the decoration system or the arc tempered. Both are cool and fun, but I don't think that for me, that really is the meat and potatoes that are going to keep me playing for 500 to 1,000 hours. Then again, this is not a G release, so to say, so I have a lot of hope for Iceborne and, yeah, a lot of faith in the team. The next game I played was Detroit Become Human, and this is one where it was I was almost interested in it more because of all the hate I was seeing online. Um, I thought all the trailers were really well done. I know they had that sort of taboo trailer at the Paris Games Week, I think it was. Um, which I didn't, even as a father with a daughter, I didn't find it offensive. Uh, I thought it was intriguing. Um, but this all came with some research. I found out that everybody is very much against this David Cage guy. Um, apparently he's made promises or written ways that people were not happy with. Um, so I was like, oh, well, whatever. I've never played any of his games. Um, and, you know, sometimes it takes the right concept for a studio to show their true colors of how good they can get. And so I went into Detroit with high expectations, actually, because I played the demo. I thought it was really cool. I was a huge fan of games like Mass Effect 1 and 2. So anything that was like choose your own adventure, I was all about. So got the game. I played it in English, even though the Japanese dubbing is really well done. I think ultimately I played the game two or three times. Uh, I went through scenarios sort of to redo them afterwards, but um, I had a wonderful experience. It definitely is one of my highlights is one of my favorite games of this generation so far because I think it really hit the concept that I was looking for which was a choose your own adventure with intriguing uh, branches that really changed the shape of the story. I also really enjoy watching this game on Twitch. Um, Ramez, who I, I love watching, he did a playthrough and it was just funny prodding the streamers for the choices that they made and stuff like that and just seeing how different the game can get because it does get quite different uh, in some of the paths that it can go down. And this game, I think even more than any of the other games that I played this year, really showed the power of actors to make a good experience. Um, the way that they did the, obviously they did the motion capture and all the voice work, it was absolutely fantastic. It was like a long movie that just kept giving. So if you're into these types of games, this might be your cup of tea. 
then I guess it's only appropriate to go back to Monster Hunter for Generations Ultimate. This was a game that I was really surprised that came out because I honestly didn't think they were going to do it. Um, so whoever at Capcom got this done, good job to you guys. I had a lot of fun going through this game. Uh, it's another one where I got a review copy, thank you Capcom, um, and I played through all of G-Rank solo. Now granted the whole Monster Hunter Generations and Generation Ultimate are sort of balanced in a way that G-Rank or any rank in general is not incredibly hard because they want you to experiment and if they make the game too challenging then no one's going to experiment with different combinations of hunter styles and weapons and stuff like that. But it still felt really good to clear G-Rank solo. Now I ended up going back into my old habits which was playing as Prowler which I really enjoy. Um, it's one of the unique weapons and features of the Generations and Generations Ultimate games. Um, and it just happens to be really great for me. All the other weapons are really fun. The Switch port itself, I had already played this on Double Cross. Uh, was it last year in Japan? So I didn't have a lot of surprises going into this one. Um, there was a lot less people online than I hoped for. Um, I think it's because Monster Hunter World had sort of, you know, blown up. Everyone was playing that game, we're still playing it, so finding online rooms was a little bit difficult, but because I already played this game, I wasn't looking to complete everything, so I didn't find it too stressful. That being said, they keep doing sales on this game, and it's fantastic, so if you have a Switch or if you just got one for the holidays, and you're looking for that classic Monster Hunter experience, this is an awesome game, and I definitely like how different that this and Monster Hunter World play. I think they're both fantastic ways to enjoy the franchise, and I do hope and I think that they're going to continue this type of gameplay on the Nintendo Switch with a Monster Hunter built just for it because obviously I think Nintendo Switch will eventually will make a more portable version of the console and this would be the perfect game to launch with a new hardware like that. Again, pure speculation on my behalf, but that's what I hope for, it's what I dream for, we'll just have to wait and see. I ended up actually getting Red Dead Redemption 2 because everybody was praising it so much and I only did one play session of like two hours. Um, I actually never went back to the game. Uh, I, this happens to me on a lot of games, even stuff like Witcher 3. I think I only got two play sessions out of that where I was kind of just like, you know what, I'm just not feeling it. Maybe because open world games start out so slow and I'm not into those types of games. I don't know, um, but I did pay for it. So I really should go back and play some more before I give any judgment as to whether or not that game is for me or not. Likewise, I also picked up God of War, and while I ended up playing it, I think two or three play sessions, it's only about maybe three or four hours worth, I ended up watching the entire rest of the game through a Let's Play on YouTube. I know that sounds really weird, like why would you buy a game to only play it for a few hours and then watch the rest of it? Like what's the point? And the point is that I really wanted to, one, support the team. I thought what they were doing was courageous, it's crazy taking a franchise like this and making bold choices to try to you know, re-envision it. Um, that's something that I think should be supported. Um, I wanted to play it and see how it felt from just someone in the industry. I think it's a good idea to play games and get a feel for what other companies are doing because there's a lot to learn, both from the good and the bad. And I was just curious. I mean, I like God of War. I play God of War 1, 2, and 3. This is obviously plays very differently, but the whole idea of adventure, puzzle, adventure, puzzle is still there. Overall, I really enjoyed the game. I thought the, the combat was deeper than I was looking for. I think a lot of people would love it. Um, but for me, who just wanted to sort of hack and slash my way through and enjoy the story, even when I put it on story mode difficulty, I still found that it felt like it had all this depth and I was getting a little overwhelmed by it. So uh, combat I thought was great, just not what I personally was looking for at this point in the year, probably because I was also burnt out from playing so much Monster Hunter. The story itself, I thought the interactions between all the characters was really interesting, but the actual overall story I wasn't that interested in uh, might just be preference and mythology and which pantheon I'm more interested in. But the thing I enjoyed the most of this was watching the single camera cut that they did. So basically the camera never cuts and it's always following behind them from beginning to end. Um, and that's really interesting to see how do you craft a game? How do you do transition from cutscene to battle? and all that kind of stuff using a single camera cut and I think a lot of interesting learning was done here uh, that I hope that they can apply to other games as well because it certainly does keep it more intimate and a little bit more, you know, uh, tightly woven when you do something like that. Speaking of first, I also jumped on the bandwagon and got Super Smash Bros. Ultimate for the Nintendo Switch. Um, I haven't played a whole lot of it so far. I've unlocked all the characters and I started playing the World of Light story mode uh, but that's about it, so I really don't have in-depth thoughts except for 
Uh, the game obviously is very well built, uh, it's tight, uh, the, the frame rate is fantastic. I was over at a friend's house where a holiday sort of uh, dinner and there was a lot of people playing and I got to see and participate in 7-8 person Smash, which was absolutely bonkers. And for being my first Smash Brothers experience, I'm actually having a pretty good time with it. Um, I think if I was a student or if I had friends that I physically got to meet a lot, I'd be much more into these types of games. But my interest will really depend on how much I actually play after I complete the story mode, which as far as I'm told, is quite long. So it sounds like I'm going to get a lot of good gameplay out of this. Then around October, I picked up Pokemon Go again. Now I had played this for two or three months when it first came out in 2016. Uh, and I had a lot of fun, and I played all the way up to like level 22, so I did it pretty religiously, but I fell off because I ran out of things to do, and the place where I was living in Tokyo really had no Pokemon and no Pokestops anywhere around, so it ended up just being a game that you would play when you went downtown, and that really didn't work for me. Um, but I recently moved about a year ago, so I said, wait a second, I've never checked out this part of town because I'm much more closer to the center of Tokyo now, so sure enough, I went and I booted it, it still had all my data, and wham, we have like 20 gyms around within 10 minute walking distance. We have over 50 Pokestops within 10, 15 minutes walking. It's a landmine for Tokyo. So uh, the town I live in is absolutely fantastic. I was having a lot of problem with getting Yuna, my daughter, out of the house. Um, so I tried to entice her uh, through some recommendations on Twitter of us playing Pokemon Go together. Um, she was reluctant at first, but once we went outside, we had a lot of fun. Uh, we put it on her iPad, and then we just started going out every single night uh, catching Pokemon and then doing raid battles because there's so much that they've added in this game in the time I've been away. So, like, if you live in a town in which it's active, there's, like, raid battles, which is co-op, where you can get legendary Pokemon. There's, like, daily quests. There's weekly quests. There's long-term quests. There's so many different things you can do now, and they've added so many Pokemon that... You're not just finding pigeons laying around all over the place, which is how it was in the first few months. But I am level 33 now. I apologize. I do have a full friend list of 200, so I'm not able to add new friends. Um, so I appreciate it if you thought or you've asked me about that in Twitter. And if I didn't respond, I apologize. Uh, but yeah, if you live in a town in which Pokemon Go is active, it might be worth checking it out again. Now this game I can't talk too much on because it's not out in the West and it's kind of unfair to do so, but I've also been playing a lot of Fantasy Life Online. This sort of is like a sequel kind of remake, I don't know how you would call it, of the original Fantasy Life, which was an unbelievably good game on the Nintendo 3DS. But it basically took the characters, the assets, and they reworked it into a mobile game. So it feels like the first game, but it's not quite the same. Um, it's certainly a little bit more tailored towards mobile, but they made it like a 3DS game. They didn't make it like a gotcha game or like a mobile game that just sucks your wallet dry. You can play this scene endlessly and do everything without ever feeling like you have to spend money. Um, it's cute, it's charming, everything I love about the 3DS game and more is in this thing. So if Fantasy Life Online comes to the West next year, like later next year maybe, um, I'll cover it on my channel probably because I gotta be honest, I enjoy this franchise or this game so much, I'd say it's as good as Monster Hunter. It's that high in my books of how much I love it. It definitely has the DNA of Monster Hunter as well, um, and also all the other JRPGs that I played back in the day. Uh, being able to just take all the different aspects, whether it's gathering an item, uh, crafting an item, and defeating monsters, and the way that they split it up into 12 lives, and how they work in the synergy between them, it's just fantastic. Honestly, if you have a 3DS and you haven't played the original Fantasy Life, I highly recommend you pick it up. It is an unbelievably charming game. Near the end of the year, we did pick up Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. Uh, Yuna got Eevee, I got Pikachu. Um, I ended up beating the game and getting my Mewtwo, and she just recently beat it as well. So I'd say that we enjoyed it. I mean, the fact that we played from beginning to end is actually a really big deal. For some of the games, we don't actually do that. So yeah, we had a lot of fun. It obviously is a remake of a very old game, so it's not, it doesn't feel like a new game, so to say. Um, but the animations are adorable for the two main characters, uh, Pikachu and Eevee, and we had a good time sort of going into it. The one thing I can't stand about the game though, is how hard it is to catch Pokemon. Um, no matter how you throw it, um, it's just a roll of the dice. So if there was ever a game in which the desire sensor wanted to pick on me, it was this game. And it gets really annoying, but I like some of the stuff that they did. Um, I like that you don't have to battle Pokemon and able to catch them. 
Uh, for some people, they hated that. They thought this was like a casual version of Pokemon for Pokemon Go players. And I kind of see that, um, but in a way, I don't. And anything that gets newer players to experience the older generation's games is always a win for a franchise. So, uh, two thumbs up to Nintendo, and I can't wait to see the actual Switch version of Pokemon coming later next year. Then finally, it brings us up to current day, and honestly, I'm playing a lot of Fantasy Life Online, and my daughter for Christmas got Dragon Quest Builders 2. Um, it's the sequel to the hit game on the PlayStation 4, and I believe they released it on Switch later, uh, Dragon Quest Builders, which is a fantastic game that I highly recommend. Um, the sequel just came out in Japan here a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a brand new story. They Honestly, it shows already that they took all the things that people didn't like about the first one and they made them much better. Uh, so it definitely feels like a labor of love. Uh, the game is quite expensive here in Japan. It was like $80 or $90. Um, I mean, games in general in Japan are pretty expensive, but this one was a little bit even more. Um, but I guess that's the Square Enix tax or whatever you want to call it. But the game is great, so I'm sure this is going to come to the West eventually, so you guys can look forward to that. Uh, but in the meantime, we are going to be playing it through together. Uh, and then two games that I keep coming back to every now and then periodically to sort of play them and check in on them. Uh, one of them is Slime Rancher, which me and Yuna are huge fans of. Uh, Slime Rancher, I talked about last year in my video, is one of my games of the year. It's just a nice chill way, and they keep adding new content. And this is another game that is like always on sale, so when it is, you really should jump on and check it out. It's on multiple platforms now, and it's just one of those games that I really enjoy. Another one I do come back to check up on, so to say, is Dauntless. It's a free-to-play hunting game for the PC, and I believe they announced it's coming to some consoles as well. Um, it's another one that's evolving really nicely. Um, it sort of reminds me of something like Warframe, where you know the game just keeps getting richer and better through every increment, and the community so far seems incredibly positive, dedicated, and very nice. And I definitely see some DNA overlap because it is a hunting type game with Monster Hunter, but you have to remember this is a free-to-play sort of PC-focused game, and the Monster Hunter games are traditional paid-for console games, so the way the games are designed are a little bit different. Uh, so you can't go looking into this as just a flat-out Monster Hunter clone. It really is its own thing and does its own thing. So, cool, if you don't have money, check it out. It's totally free to do that. Um, and I do like to see the new behemoths when they add them to the game. Okay, well that is probably enough rambling on and on about the games I played this year. Let me know down in comments below what games you played and which ones really stuck out. I know there was tons and tons of good games that was released in 2018 that I have not played. Um... You know, obviously the Game Awards touched on just a few of those, so I'll probably try to go back into a catalog and play those, uh, because I don't see myself really playing Monster Hunter until uh, I might do some of like the Arc Tempered Nerg, um, but up until Iceborne, I think I'm kind of sitting it out and just saving my energy, and then we're going to go crazy on Iceborne when it comes out in fall next year. Uh, so next year is promising to be another fantastic year for gaming. Hope it is for you guys as well. As I said in multiple videos, I am technically on break from YouTube until probably spring until we get some information about Iceborne, but I might make periodical videos like this. Um, it's just really trying to take the commitment off of my shoulders to make Monster Hunter content because I'm not currently playing the game and I'm sort of taking a break so that I can go a haul in when Iceborne comes out. That being said, the developer's encyclopedia for Monster Hunter World does come out later in January and I'm sure it's going to be a lot of interesting things about the lore and the creation of the game. And because I speak and read Japanese, I'm going to go through there, and if I find a lot of interesting content, I'll try to group it together into a video to, to share with everybody else. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you had a wonderful holidays. Hope you have a great new year. Stay safe, be happy. Until next time, happy hunting.